and Near Eastern Archaeology. Someone who is a, has been uh, in love with uh, Near Eastern Archaeology and this part of the world since she was a little girl. And her name is Professor Jean Nichown. I knew I was going to ruin that one. So please, uh, go ahead. And, and, uh, uh, due to time constraints, I'm just going to say thank you for, for having me. Um, tonight I'm going to talk to you as an archaeologist. Um, I am not a text person, and um, so I will leave the textual analysis and so forth to our other respected scholars. Uh, it's interesting, uh, we didn't know the other people on the panel or what they were going to talk about. And uh, Professor Skinner talked about the, the Covenanters in the Qumran community. Um, this is actually an hypothesis. This is not a proven fact. So what I'm actually going to present to you tonight is a quite different view of what Professor Skinner did about the people who actually lived at Qumran. So, going back here, so here's Qumran at the top of the, the Dead Sea. And I will say that when I started researching the Dead Sea Scrolls, my area is actually second millennium BC, Mesopotamia, and ancient Iraq. This is obviously first millennium. But I've done a lot of research in this area. Um, I have worked on a lot of excavations in the Middle East, and I know from first-hand experience what archaeology is like in the Middle East. A couple of things in Egypt have been all through Egypt, all through Syria, worked in all through Iraq, I've worked in Jordan, I've worked in Turkey. I've worked mainly with some um, anthropologists, but my background is actually anthropology, and we ask different kinds of questions. So, again, here's Qumran, here are the caves. I would suggest from the outset that there is really absolutely nothing to connect the scrolls with the site of Qumran except proximity. Every single one of the scrolls was looted. Uh, some of them were quote-unquote excavated. I have worked with people with uh, no background in anthropology. Their backgrounds are um, history, um, biblical studies, but they don't have any archaeological training, and it shows. They're asking different questions. Consequently, a lot of the information that could have been learned from scientific excavation in the scrolls is, has been lost, especially in Cave 4. The, Be uh, the Bedouin looted it, which means you're not getting the stratigraphy, you're not getting the pollen, you're not getting the soil. There's really nothing to tell us when the scrolls were deposited, who deposited them, where they came from, when they were deposited, or even why. Um, there was a tradition that manuscripts could not just be thrown away. They had to be buried, deposited um, respectfully. So we're not even sure whether these were hidden or just stored away because they were old and buried because this was a respectful way to dispose of them. We just don't know that. Um, we, we honestly can't say. I was told to keep my remarks between 15 and 20 minutes. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, so please feel free to ask me questions um, later. The origin um, is being now referred to as the Qumran community. And as I said, this is a perspective that is still very prevalent. All you have to do is go to the internet and you'll see this a lot. The original announcement of the Dead Sea Scrolls from 1948 includes, um, so the comparatively, notice the words, un comparatively unknown sect, and possibly I put down the essays. They use the word monastic order. This carries all kinds of cultural baggage. It really refers to a medieval lifestyle that is utterly inappropriate to put into first century or first century, first millennium BC in um, what is now Palestine, Israel, whatever. Um, it conjures up all kinds of lifestyle, gender, men living separate, no women, um, and so forth. Um, if an anthropologist ever put a word like this into their dissertations or publications, they would be 
um, kicked out of the profession or <laughs> certainly ignored. This is just, it's inappropriate. It's not the right thing to do. So, and again, notice the word possibly. Within six months, that word was dropped. We get, as I said, when I talk to people about the other sea scrolls, either they know nothing or they tell me the Essenes lived at Qumran and wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, unfortunately, my pastor said that one day in the sermon, and I'm sitting there in the fire going, no, 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 no. Luckily, she took it in good heart. Um, so, I, uh, this is sort of one of my soapbox issues. Uh, so this is the archaeological site of Qumran, which Professor Skinner also showed us. It was given to excavate by Father Roland DeVoe. Again, no, he's tied. He's a Dominican father. He had biblical training. He was probably very good. He had zero archaeological training. And he went into the excavation, and I will put that in quotations, of Qumran with a preconceived idea. That is, again, the absolutely wrong thing to do. Because you collect what fits your hypothesis, you discard what doesn't. Um, I read about this excavation. And as I said, as an anthropologist, anthropologist or archaeologist, it makes me absolutely cringe. He basically took uh, part of the site and just went straight through it. So he did, uh, did one room, he hit multiple floors, it went under one number or one group. Um, once archaeological is a destructive activity, once it's destroyed, you don't have a chance to go through it. So basically, in our parlance, he trashed the site. Um, and there's nothing we can do with it. Again, we go back to this, we just don't know. But he did go in with a preconceived idea that this was a monastic order that lived at the site and produced the scrolls. Hence, we get, I pulled this off the internet, and as I said, just rise me up. Um, I get excited about this sort of thing. I say, reconstruction of Essene site, and I want to screaming at it. It's no, you can't say it's an Essene site. You can't demonstrate that. And Professor DeVoe put these, again, incredibly suggestive labels. Scriptorium, refractory. Again, he is using the languages of a medieval monastery. Absolutely inappropriate in this context. You can't demonstrate it. Um, here's a picture of the supposed scriptorium. Not a single piece of parchment was found at Qumran. Not one. There was three inkwells. So, sorry, um, I, I don't buy it. And I said, when I first started this, I assumed, like everybody else, this, this was an Essene site. But as my, my archaeological training took over, I'm thinking, like, wait a minute. I also found that as early as the late 1950s, people were questioning this hypothesis. So. I said I could talk more, but because of time constraints, I'm moving on. Um, what more or less is agreed that the site did go through several uh, permutations. One, in the reign of uh, John Hyrcanus I, in about 130 BC right here, the site was abandoned. It had an earlier incantation, but it actually started out its life, for the most part, as a uh, Hasmonean fortress in the reign of John Hyrcanus I. Again, I could talk more about why that was, because of its position and so forth. Here's um, part of the old plan of Qumran during the uh, Hasmonean period. This fort and tower has actually had been rebuilt. Here's kind of the outlines of it right here with a cistern. So here's a, I, I love the, the drawings. You can see the, the fortress right here. It's just much more of a small site. Then it was uh, expanded in the time of Herod the Great. And it is best, I said, I looked at a lot of different hypotheses about what Qumran actually was. And the most reasonable explanation from the archaeological standpoint, it was that it was a country estate of a wealthy Jewish family. Are any of you um, devotees of Dat Mabi? <laughs> Yay! Think Dat Mabi. <laughs> These are country estates that need to pay for themselves. In other words, they had to have industry. So this is the expansion during the, the uh, Herodian period, Herodian period. This is the, the old part 
and it was expanded to, um, to say so more in the line of this country estate. And the reasons are said again, I need to go through relatively quickly. Um, here's a drawing of it, and note I'm Feksha down here, I'll talk about this site. This was about a mile and a half away. So here's the plan here. So, for one thing, um, there was industrial areas at Qumran. I just said, this is a country estate that needs to support his, itself. It needs to have, uh, produce, uh, you know, uh, things to pay for the people who live there. So, it had a potter's kiln, it had a wine press. Over here are grinding, this was grinding areas for grinding grain and so forth. And these were things I can't at the moment read. So, um, oh, furnaces. These were furnaces, and those again will come through in a minute. So here are the pictures of these, are again, uh, there was a potter's wheel. Here's a kiln from Qumran. Here's a wine press. This was a donkey, oh dear, hit the wrong buttons here. Um, here's the, this is, I outlined these, see, this is the remnants of it here, is this donkey powered mill. Now we go to Infectia, and this is particularly important because even Father DeVoe uh, at the beginning thought that these two sites were actually owned by the same person. So, and here's, I kind of drew along, there was a wall that kind of connected the two. At Infectia, we have, again, I'm going to go through this quickly, there is balsam oil was a product of the Dead Sea. And in fact, now there's a move to bring back the balsam plant and the balsam oil in the, the, uh, um, the state of Israel is actually promoting uh, and, and, and uh, working with uh, bringing back the balsam plant. But there was an active balsam industry right here. This is one of the jugglets found in that area. Oh, this is the, the uh, bushes that they're working on now. Balsam oil production has four stages. Of three stages they found at the site of Infectia. The fourth stage was required furnaces to produce the final product. Those were the furnaces that I showed you at Qumran. And here's all these perfume jugglets from Qumran. If we look at Qumran as this isolated community of, um, you know, uh, monastic people sitting in the scriptorium writing scrolls, um, then part of this thing was, was poverty and that they were isolated. And these jugglers kind of proves the opposite. They wouldn't have had um, connections with the outside world. Well, you can't imagine a monastic community um, having any reason to be producing balsam oil. But again, this is one of these pieces of evidence that the father kind of disregarded because it didn't really fit into his perception of what this site was and who was living there. That, but the fact that if it wasn't an Essene or a monastic community, that has uh, really no bearing on the, the um, how important the scrolls actually are. It, it, it doesn't. So um, it is said it doesn't really matter that there wasn't the Qumran community that was producing these scrolls. They're important in and of themselves. But we should be clear about if we're going to say that this was a community of ascetics or a monastic community, we better be able to at least demonstrate it reasonably. But the archaeological evidence actually argues against it. So the balsam industry, again, here's a lamp um, that's part of it. Glass. This is glass from Qumran Caves. Glass, again, was a very rare commodity. It was an expensive commodity. And a lot of this came from the Nabataean area. And if you've been to Petra, that's the head of the Nabataean, one of the big Nabataean trade sites in Jordan. And again, this shows Qumran's connection with the outside world, that it wasn't an isolated community. Carved stone vessels, there's actually one or two of those down in, in Denver. Again, um, really rather nice. Money. If you're a monastic community that are living simply in this pure lifestyle, you're not going to need money. But if you are a country estate 
it is supporting itself, uh, it is tied into the wider community of the Dead Sea, of the Jordan, of, of Jerusalem, and so forth, you are part of a monetary, you're going to need money. And this was, again, over 1,200 coins that were found at Qumran. So again, how do you explain it? Um, then there's the issue of the cemetery. Um, I, again, I just outlined it right here. Um, there's women found in that cemetery. Um, a lot of it has not been excavated, uh, and again, they, they can't because of political reason. But the real issue about this cemetery is one, the size, and then two, if they're so hung up on purity, they are not going to have this massive, massive cemetery so close to their living areas. That would not argue for somebody that's, you know, super worried about uh, purity, is because of course um, dead people are always um, unpure, almost by definition. In the cemetery, we see this comb, a necklace, again, that doesn't again argue with poverty and being unconnected from the outside world. The water system, the mikvah system, is again another reason this emphasis on purity that is supposedly um, argues for the, um, the monastic order being involved in purity. There's 10 mikvahs ritual baths at Qumran, and there's a downside for unpure and upside for, for pure. Um, to be fair to, to Father Duvall, when he excavated Qumran, uh, it was kind of a first. It was the first site like this that had been excavated. It really did look unique. But since then, lots of other sites have been excavated, and this number of mikvahs, 10, isn't that out of line with many other sites in that same area. Same thing with the, um, once you look at the archaeology of Qumran in terms of the country estate, there's actually quite a distribution of manor houses in this whole area of Qumran. It was the first, it looked unique. When you start looking at the other excavations that happened since 1950, it doesn't look so unique. So there's Qumran there, there's some of the other things in the area. Finally, the uh, way, one reason Qumran got identified with Essenes is because in Pliny the Elder, he said there was an Essene site above Ein Gedi. In our 21st century American minds, above Auction, actually, you would think north. But he might have been thinking up, you know, in terms of just elevation. So, um, I think it was Hirschfeld, looked, there's Ein Gedi down there, and I looked above, literally above Ein Gedi, and lo and behold, there is a settlement. And if you think of Essenes as being living simply, kind of think hermits, um, maybe early day hippie types, you know, they're living in little shelters, living off the land, um, there is a site that actually is above Ein Gedi. It could very well be the Essene site in the area that he was referring to rather than Qumran. Here's a couple of remains of the um, shelters that he suggests that are Essene. And lastly, this distribution of sites that there were other Essenes in the area all along there. Again, I went through this rather quickly, but I did want to make you aware that the archaeological evidence um, taken from kind of a, hopefully, uh, as unbiased perspective as possible, doesn't it really much more supports the idea of a manor house that is earning their own living than um, this monastic order. Uh, and I said that it doesn't detract from the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I just said their relationship is really more because of its proximity rather than the fact that there was a community writing the scrolls. Thank you. In, uh, at the ICB, and we are treated to yet another set of visuals, so thank you. I think by the end of tonight we may feel just to scramble, all of our thoughts will be scrambled and we'll have to do a lot of thinking and visiting the exhibit ourselves and uh, come up with our own conclusions. So this is, uh, this is extraordinary.